Italy. So hi everyone, uh, good to see you all here. See yeah. names we know, we've seen. Um, it's great to have you here. So yeah, yeah we, we decided to try to present the AOS um, First Caribbean presentation as a webinar for those of you who could not make it. So hopefully you'll find it very interesting. This is the first um, hour and we'll try to have another one in, in December or January. Um, but that one would be uh, with a few colleagues from Puerto Rico who were impacted by, the, by uh, Hurricane Fiona. So we'll, we'll try to see when is the better time for, for, for them. So the way we'll do it, we have uh, so Hannah, um, and then Farah, then Anne and Natalia. And they will talk for about 12 minutes each with uh, a few minutes for questions. And we'll have the question right after each presentation. And then this way, <clears throat> hopefully we should not uh, last too much longer than an hour. So Hannah, feel free to start. And I'll let you know when you're at 10 minutes. Sounds good. Yep. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. And hear me? Yes, okay. Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, today I'm going to present a study that has just been published in Marine Ornithology. It's open access, so please feel free to go and uh, download the article. Uh, this is a study that we conducted on St. Eustatius, and uh, it's a collaboration between myself and Ivan and Pat Jodis and Brad Wilkinson from Clemson. And we studied the foraging ecology of red-billed tropic birds in the Caribbean. Yeah. Okay, why is it not moving? Yeah. Okay, so for those that don't know, uh, there are three species of tropic birds that occur globally. And as the name implies, it's a tropical seabird species. So uh, the red-tailed tropic bird is the most numerous between 40 and 80,000. The white-tailed tropic bird uh, is estimated to be above 50,000. And the red-billed tropic bird, which is our study species, is the largest of the three, but the least numerous. So global e estimations are no more than 30,000. So um, it's, a, it's a study, it's a species that has not been well studied. Um, and for that reason, we thought it was an important species to do some research on. It's a pelagic species, meaning it spends most of its life out at sea. Um, and in the Caribbean, there are some globally significant breeding populations. And this is the kind of area where you find them breeding. They occupy these rocky crevices. Uh, they, they don't manipulate them in any way. They just enter and find a nice, nice breeding uh, uh, space and that's where you'll find them. You can find the white tail sticking out of the cliff face and uh, very often if you were walking along uh, you would hear them shouting at you to go away. Um, they're very faithful to their nest, nest site and also quite faithful to their nest mate. They don't mate for life but um, they are quite faithful within their pairs and they can reach sexual maturity within five years at which point the beak of the chick will turn red meaning that it's ready to breed and as i said there's a few uh, globally significant populations in the caribbean uh, we have st eustatius which has between three and five hundred pairs there's Saber, which is our neighbor, which has about 1,500 pairs. And in Little Tobago, there are approximately 1,000 pairs. Of course, there are other populations 
scattered around the Caribbean, but these are the ones that we know of and feel free to, you know, let me know if you have some lots and lots of tropic birds where you live. So here's a very uh, basic map of the island. You can see that they are nesting primarily here on uh, the western, northwestern coast of the island. And if we zoom in, you can see that these little dots all represent uh, nest cavity. So they're somewhat scattered along the cliff, uh, cliff um, coastline. And there are a couple of clumps of nests as well. And this is how it looks in reality. So it is in it is by no means an easy access uh, <laughs> type of field work. It's yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. Let me put it that way. So what did we do? We uh, decided, OK, in fact, it was Pat who introduced me to Ivan and Ivan came over to Stacia some years ago and together we deployed some loggers. Uh, the loggers are called I Got You. They're freely available from Amazon, um, you know, $50, $60. And what you do is you break it open and you waterproof it and you attach it. I don't know if you can see, but you attach it here as we did just with some tape to the base of the tail. And so that's what we did. And we learned by uh, <laughs> losing quite a lot of loggers that um, only deploy them on an adult that has a very small chick. So we realized that our window was quite small. So we would have to deploy them before and retrieve them before the chick was three weeks old. Um, the reason for this is that the adults will, will come regularly to feed the chick when it's small. But as it gets older, they don't spend so much time with it. So it's much more difficult to retrieve the loggers. Uh, we set them to record every three minutes. And then we uploaded all of our GPS points into MoveBank, movebank.org, which is a great website. If any of you are interested, just go and have a look at some really interesting studies. We also collected regurgitates at the, at the nest site. So uh, if we were weighing a chick and it regurgitated its food, we would collect fresh samples. We also collected dry samples just opportunistically um, and uh, to see what the adults were feeding the chicks. And some of our hypotheses were that the tropic bird would forage during the day, primarily. We predicted that they would forage on a high diversity of flying fish and they would associate with subsurface predators. We also predicted that they would forage in nutrient rich waters and that they would travel extensively. And we also thought that they would feed primarily on flying fish and squid. So in our analysis, we essentially, um, we based our analysis on a great paper that was done by Diop et al um, in Senegal and St. Helena on the other side of the Atlantic. So again, if you're interested, please go ahead and download that paper because they will they outline exhaustively uh, the analysis that they did. So essentially, we, we did the same thing that they did because we wanted to be able to compare what they had done with what we had done because we, all, we both studied the same species. So I won't go into too much detail. Uh, it can be a bit technical, but just generally, this is what we did uh, to get our results. So uh, in MoveBank, it's a great website that you can link all of your GPS locations to certain variables. So we selected a number of variables uh, such as chlorophyll A, sea surface temperature, bathymetry, and so on and so forth, uh, you know, salinity to see, okay, are there um, any variables that are particularly 
uh, linked to when these birds are foraging and maybe we can then um, answer the question as to why they forage in certain areas in Movebank. And some of the other variables that we were looking at, as I said, were flying fish and uh, subsurface predators. So some sea, seabirds do forage in association with uh, large fish such as tuna, mackerel and wahoo. And so we wanted to investigate that as well. So at the end of our study, uh, we did lose a lot of loggers to begin with. Um, and that was just a trial and error. Uh, but eventually we recovered 37 loggers. Uh, the average deployment time was close to six days. So essentially we would have to go back and revisit the site every day to try to retrieve the loggers, which was quite time consuming. Uh, out of those 37 loggers, we recorded 45 trips and the average distance was 43 kilometers. But the maximum distance that one bird traveled was almost 900 kilometers. And so here you can see a very simple graphic that shows um, a trip that was made by one single bird. So the camera represents the island. And then you can see that each line, each different color uh, represents a day. So this bird went out for one, two, three, five days. And the red line is where, okay, it had finished doing its foraging and it went directly back to the colony. And so this map represents all of the trips that we were able to log. And the triangle represents the island. And you can see that there's a quite a big cluster of trips that were around the islands. And then there's a few that really went much greater distances. And you can see that one of them actually, the battery ran out and this bird traveled almost halfway to Aruba. So it did a quite extensive foraging trip. So for our first hypothesis where we predicted that the birds would travel during, would forage during the day, indeed it confirmed that they were diurnal uh, foragers. So you can see that the white uh, part of this graphic represents the day. Um, so foraging at the top, you can see that there's much, a uh, lots of points that represent the bird foraging. And so they start foraging really right after sunrise and they continue foraging more or less uh, at the same rate throughout the day, just tapers off a little bit. Hey, Anna, uh, the, dark, the darker area. Minutes. Oh, okay, I'm gonna hurry up a bit. Um, so some of the variables that we talked about earlier, uh, we found that bathymetry was significant, meaning that the birds were foraging in deeper waters. We found that uh, species richness of flying predicted. And uh, we also discovered that the birds were indeed foraging in waters that had higher chlorophyll concentrations, meaning more nutrients. So we translated the GPS points into kernel density estimates. So you can see again, the dark green is the core foraging going out to the lighter green, which are the maximum foraging areas. So you can see the red lines represent exclusive economic zones. So as you can see, these birds just uh, travel extensively and uh, don't care about our EECs or MPAs. And to that extent, uh, so they've traveled through all of these MPAs and EECs. And what does that mean? Well, it means that these uh, exclusive economic zones that these birds forage within uh, are important for the species. And actually these countries are responsible for their protection. And the question is, how do you get them to protect a species that may not uh, breed on their island? And that, that is something that we have to discuss and tackle in, uh, in future legislations. 
As for the diet, we found that it primarily composed of uh, flying fish and needlefish. Uh, we found very few squid, which was contrary to our hypothesis. And finally, um, yeah, because tropical marine environments are uh, quite uh, resource poor, it's, it's difficult really to predict the foraging patterns because the prey is so scattered. And uh, so it's quite unpredictable. As I said, tropic birds just don't recognize political boundaries. They don't care. And so how, how are we going to tackle this? And one of our suggestions was maybe we can create specially protected areas of Caribbean importance. The other suggestion was to repl replicate the study elsewhere, which you, we have recently done on Sabre and has just been accepted in our DEA. So that will be out soon. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you to all that supported this project. And sorry, I went over a bit, but if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, we have one, time for one question. So uh, Kirk, I saw that you um, asked a question about avian influenza. If you don't mind, we can answer your question at the end of the seminar because not really about uh, Hannah's work. But Tony Diamond has a question about, um, so Hannah, did you find any effect of tags uh, on breeding success on the birds themselves or breeding success? Effect of the loggers? Yes. No, we didn't, no, we, um, no, we tested that and uh, there was no uh, negative effect of the loggers and you'll be able to see that in the paper, Tony, and I'll be happy to send you a copy. Thank you, Hannah. So we'll move on with, Thank you. Uh, with Farah. Let um, me stop sharing. Yeah, you have to stop sharing and then Farah should be able to share her screen. So while Farah Mukida is um, preparing her sc screen, She's still here, yes. Um, so for question, you could either type them just like Tony did in the Q&A box, or you could also uh, raise your hand uh, when you have a question at the end of the talk and we can try to unmute you. Thank you. Go ahead, Farah. And so I'll let you know about, at about 10 minutes as well. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I'm just gonna put my video on for like a second because my bandwidth is pretty poor. Yeah. Hi. I'm going to take it off. All right. Um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be presenting on a restoration initiative that the Angola National Trust in partnership with Fauna and Flora International and Wildlife Management International undertook during the middle of last year on Sombrero Island. Um, there we go. So Sombrero lies 65 kilometers northwest of mainland Angola. So it's up there on the left-hand corner of the map. So it's remote, very flat and relatively small at just 37 hectares. So for a little bit of history, between 1856 and 1890, the island was the site of an extensive phosphate mining operation. So it's once lush, surface vegetation that supported a giant tortoise, as well as its topography were completely devastated by dynamite blasting by the mining company as they extracted the fossilized bird guano. And it was also the site of Angola's only manned lighthouse, which was constructed and manned uh, beginning in 1868 until it became automated in 2001. So while the island is currently uninhabited, it's been significantly altered and impacted by human activities. But despite this, the island's biodiversity is significant, um, so much so that the island, along with its surrounding waters, were declared Angola's first Ramsar site in 2019. It's also an IBA and a KBA and was declared a nature reserve and marine park in 2009. So its waters provide critical habitats to a range of pelagic and benthic fish species, lobsters, conchs, and sharks. And on the island, the endemic and critically endangered Sombrero brown lizard, and possibly an endemic tree lizard, two species of geckos, 
and six species of nesting seabirds, including regionally important population of mass boobies can be found. But Timbero's biodiversity has been at risk um, from climate change and the stronger and slower hurricanes that are expected to go with it, as well as, well as the longer periods of drought that are similarly projected. So while Anguilla contributes very little to the causes of climate change, the island and its biodiversity are on the front line of this crisis. But we're taking steps to increase our resilience through the implementation of nature-based solutions, as well as by addressing threats that we actually do have some control over, including invasive species. So house mice are considered to be one of the most widespread invasive species around the world. And they're listed on the Global Invasive uh, Species Database as one of the 100 worst in invasive species. They were first introduced to Sombrero when the island was mined for phosphate. And since then, they've likely had an impact on the island's fauna and flora, including the endemic ground lizard and smaller seabirds. Uh, fortunately, though, with support from a wide range of funders, we've been able to apply a collaborative, comprehensive approach to the restoration of the island uh, within the larger context of species preservation, as well as nature reserve and marine park management. So part of this restoration work included the removal of mice from the island. And in June, 2021, we launched one of our most challenging restoration initiatives, challenging because of how far the island is from the mainland. It takes between one to two hours to get to the island by boat and also because of its terrain and the sheer logistics of moving literally tons of supplies and equipment up, up a cliff line um, using a ladder. So the uh, eradication operation was conducted between 14 June and 10 August and was directed by John Tayton and Toby Ross and overseen by Biz Bell of Wildlife Management International. It also included 19 AT staff, local contractors and collaborating partners with the operation totaling 441 person days. There were three phases to the eradication initiative. Um, the first was establishing the bait station grid. The second was removing the mice, so that's the baiting period. And then the third was intensive monitoring. And it took us four days to establish the bait points with bait points being placed on either a 10 by 10 or a 20 by 20 meter grid over the entire island for a total of 990 points. Baiting took place uh, between 19 June and the 9th of August with bait being checked once a day and replaced when eaten by mice or taken by non-target species or damaged by weather. And we use Claret bait, which is toxic to mammals, but it doesn't affect insects or crustaceans. And because of its blue color and its bittering agent, it's not actually attractive to reptiles or to birds. And we're very thankful that there were actually no non-target species mortalities. And while we continued to bait throughout the entire operation, the last bait take was actually recorded on the 28th of July at a single bait point. Um, the baiting was coupled with intensive monitoring, which ran for 36 days. So that was from the 3rd of July through to the 10th of August. And we used six different types of monitoring tools, which included flavored wax, tracking tunnels, trail cameras, chew cards, uh, resin blocks, and soap. And signs of mice were observed on only 22 of the 1,880 monitoring stations. So through the eradication operation and our ongoing monthly monitoring of the island since last August, it appears as though our eradication efforts were successful as there's been no further signs of mice. So to put this eradication program into context though, the ANT has been working with the government of Anguilla's Fisheries and Marine Resources Unit and France-based Blue Finance on a complementary Darwin Plus and EU Resembit funded project uh, that focuses on enhancing marine park management in Anguilla. So through this project, we're working with a multi-stakeholder marine park management planning committee to develop and implement site-specific management plans for all of Anguilla's marine parks, including Sombrero Island Nature Reserve Marine Park. So the eradication of mice was identified as a priority action, but so too was improving our understanding of the state of the marine environment 
and monitoring change over time, of both marine and terrestrial biodiversity, especially post-eradication for the island itself. So between 2019 and 2021, we've conducted two assessments of the endemic ground lizard population with results showing the lizard numbers have almost doubled with a population of just under 900 individuals now. And we'll be conducting another mark remark survey next year. Now, in addition to our work uh, with lizards, we're also continuing with our nesting seabird counts. We established baselines for all species in 2013 with support from Birds Caribbean followed by additional assessments in 2014, 2015, 2021, and then in June of this year. So the highest number of apparently occupied nests for both brown boobies and mass boobies were recorded this year with, 19, with 916 and 236 nests respectively. And nest contents for both species range from eggs to almost fledged chicks. And then over the last couple of years, we've seen declines in numbers of apparently occupied nests of both brown boobies and bridled terns, uh, with a more significant decline being observed amongst the bridles. Uh, this could perhaps be attributed to the difficulty in finding the, nest, the nests as they tend to nest in um, deep craters and under boulders, but we've also recorded similar declines on some of our other offshore keys. So we'll continue to monitor to see if this is just a short-term blip or if it's the beginning of a downward trend. Uh, both city terns and laughing gulls breed in very small numbers on Sombrero, and we've only really been able to count flushed adults as it's been very difficult to locate their nests. But we found nests, so we can actually confirm breeding activity. So we'll continue our annual seabird counts for the next four years as part of our intensive post eradication monitoring program, followed by comprehensive counts every five years thereafter. Um, we've also begun work to revegetate the island for the benefit of Sombrero's biodiversity. So FFI secured the services of Cavell Lindsay, a leading regional um, ecologist to assess the flora and to provide recommendations for restoration of native plant species. So Cavell found that in 2021, there were 12 species of plants found on the island, but there may have been actually 20 or more species prior to 1860 based on the research that he was able to conduct. So since September last year, we've been working with Cavell's report and have been collecting and dispersing seeds. All seeds were treated prior to outplanting activities as we want to prevent the accidental spread of invasive species or pests. We've also planted over a dozen different types of seeds and have been monitoring their growth on a monthly basis. But despite our efforts, only seeds of four species have germinated and survived. So given this low germination success rate, we know that we need to try other revegetation methods. So with funding from the Prince of Wales Charitable Fund uh, or Foundation, we'll construct a nursery in situ using water from an already existing cistern. And then we'll germinate the seeds in substrate found on Sombrero and then outplant those seedlings after they've been hardened. If <clears throat> you're at 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, so other additional priority activities include building our migratory bird species list through visual and passive acoustic surveys. And this is being conducted with assistance from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We'll also construct perches for passerines, which may also help with natural seed dispersal and pollination. And we'll conduct additional benthic surveys, both within the marine park boundaries and outside of it. So despite our work and our plans, we recognize that Sombrero's transformation will likely take some time and it requires long-term investment. And we also know that it's likely not going to see that type of awe-inspiring change that has been witnessed on some of the other islands in the region that have been restored, like Redonda, where after just a couple of years of removing rats and goats, the island's barren lunar landscape was just completely covered in vegetation. But Sombrero is just not that type of an island. But that doesn't diminish its importance um, as a sanctuary for biodiversity or the need to enhance uh, the resilience of that biodiversity to a changing climate. So that's something that the National Trust and our local partners 
and international partners are absolutely committed to. And uh, that's it. Great, thank, thank you. you. So we have a few more minutes for questions. Uh, just before we start with questions, we had a comment from Claire Pusineri from SPORAC. Um, just a, a comment saying that the SPA protocol is also a, a valuable tool for regional conservation of seabirds. And the appendix uh, two includes rosier terns and nest terns and uh, shear waters, <clears throat> among others. Um, so we have two questions about your, your talk, Farah. One from Jen Tegara. Um, can you provide the name of the type of bait you used? Sure, so it's called Clarat and it's made by Syngenta. Would you mind okay. writing it down in the chat, if you don't mind? Sure. Or <clears throat> then you're answering to Ashley's question. Oh, it's the same question, okay. I didn't realize we had the same question twice. Mm -hmm. Do we have <clears throat> any other question for Farah? Feel free to type them in the chat if you want, or try to raise your hand as well. So if we don't have other questions, then maybe we can move on um, with Anne Sutton's presentation. And if you have more questions, feel free to ask them in the chat, and then Farah can reply in the chat um, as you ask them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I want to talk to you today about a, a study that we've been doing with, with um, the Caribbean Coastal Area Management Foundation in the Portland Bight Protected Area, Jamaica. So it's quite a small study um, and it's of, of relatively few islands, but I think it's illustrative of um, the sorts of threats and challenges that many um, seabird colonies are facing. Um, throughout the region. So, okay. Now, oh, why, why can't I share my screen, change my slide here? Slight technical hitch here. So your screen is shared. <laughs> yeah, can you see this? You can, you can see my screen? We can see your screen, yeah. All right, okay. I got, I wasn't able to change the slide, but here we go. All right, so the objectives of, of the, of the study that is to describe the long-term changes in the seabird colonies of the Portland Bight protected area, to look at the threats and the trends and suggest next steps. And there's relatively few um, long-term studies of seabirds in, in the region. Uh, Portland Bight protected area is the largest protected area in Jamaica. Um, it integrates the land and the the wetlands, coastal areas, the coastal developments and towns, um, as well as a large marine space. So the coastal shelf of Jamaica is at the largest, at the widest tier, and um, has the most number of, of small um, coral keys in the, in the area. So Jamaica, has, as I say, has relatively few um, mm. offshore islands, like compared to somewhere like Cuba. There's actually four groups. Um, the Morant Keys, which are far over here, uh, about 30 miles offshore to the southeast. The Pedro Keys, which are way down here, 80 miles offshore to the south. Um, inshore, the Port Royal Keys, and then the, the largest inshore group, the Port Lumbayat Keys. Okay, sorry. So, go back. Um, yeah. So, historically, many of these keys in, in Portland Bike had seabird nests on them. We estimate there were 14 keys that were being inhabited by seabirds of, of at least six species. Um, and, but that has really declined. So currently we know of three nesting keys and three species. So there's been a big change. Um, 
So in between 1998 and 2000, we surveyed 26 sites um, in, in Portland Bight. And we confirmed at that point nesting by five species at seven sites. When we repeated that in 2021, that had declined to four species at three sites. So quite a, a big change. So what's the cause of the, of the oh, this, these are the breeding species that we, we currently have. Um, brown noddies, roseate terns, we haven't recently confirmed, bridal terns, lease terns, magnificent frigate birds, and, and we also have, we, in the past, we had brown pelicans. So this is the sort of changes we've been monitoring at the Half Moon Keys um, since 1998. In 1998, they were mostly nesting on Big Half Moon Key uh, by 2005, well, that sort of that started to change in 2001. And by 2005, there was no nesting on Big Half Moon, um, and they haven't nested there ever since. So, what happened? Well, several things happened. So, this is the, the what the keys looked like in 2002. They were heavily wooded, um, and um, and and yeah, heav heavily wooded and vegetated. Um, but hurricanes Ivan and Dean um, swept along Jamaica's south coast. It didn't actually hit Jamaica, but they were sort of skirted Jamaica, and these keys were heavily impacted. So by and this this the vegetation was almost completely was all deforested and stripped. Um, and you can see even by 2021, the um, both the size of the keys and the um, density of the vegetation. Hadn't, hadn't recovered. So this is uh, Little Half Moon Key, um, where most of the nesting case takes place. This is what it looked like after Hurricane um, Dean in 2007. Um, by 2015, it had come back a bit, but it's still very um, patchy vegetation. Brown noddies are nesting there still. Um, again, this is some more um, pictures of Little Half Moon Key um, in 2011. There's, there was, you can see that this was even without um, further hurricanes. 2011, it was still quite wooded. There was some habitation on there. But by 2022, this, this, this dense buttonwood vegetation that was in the center of the keys was still very scrappy. So Big Half Moon Key was much more heavily wooded. Um, after in the hurricanes, well, before the hurricanes, there was a there was a cat that was int introduced. The hurricanes totally stripped all the vegetation, and some and there were some poor starving dogs left on the key. Um, but even by by um, 2022, it really hadn't recovered that much. So what was going on? So here here we have sort of main events. Um, in, in around 2000, somebody brought a cat onto Big Half Moon Key. And that one cat was enough to make all the birds move from Big Half Moon onto Little Half Moon. Um, then, in the, the, so the numbers of, of, um, of brown noddies nesting on um, Little Half Moon increased, um, but then there was Hurricane Ivan and there was all dogs were introduced and people settled and starting to live on the key. That was followed by Hurricane Dean. Um, and then, as you can see, the numbers had declined quite a lot by 2009. And they've been sort of gradually building up and fluctuating ever since, but not reached the previous levels. Um, so, as I say, part of this was, uh, was a loss of, of breeding habitat. We were counting the number of, of, um, of trees. Um, and these, the number of, of trees really declined um, on Little Half Moon Key, and the species composition of the of the tree, the trees, the nesting trees also changed. So this is Half Moon Key isn't the only key where we've seen a change. This is Two Bush Key. Um, two Two Bush Key was was originally two little mangrove islands. Um, just isolated out in, in the in the in the in the bight. So the two heavily vegetated uh, red mangrove patches um, 
but by um, to 2000, by, by Hurricane Ivan, um, this key was heavily damaged. It was, it was, this was the only, the main place where um, frigate birds nest, but they you can see they were hanging on, but by 2009, it had really collapsed. Um, and, and even more by 2011, by, by 2020, um, the, the Western Key had totally damaged, but banished, and only the Eastern Key was left. So this, this, um, the Eastern Key is still there, it's still being used for nesting, but the West Key, that was another nesting area, um, is totally gone. So another uh, breeding set of keys are the big and little pelican keys. Um, originally, pelicans were nesting out there, um, and um, roseate terns and um, bridal terns were on little pelican. Big pelican key was absolutely devastated by Hurricane Dean, um, and little pelican, um, also the vegetation was, was, was damaged and there's almost no vegetation. So there's no current nesting on either of these keys. Um, and they're actually being threatened by a proposed open water resort. Somebody wants to put a hotel out there. So that's a different threat. So talking about the threats, um, apart from loss of habitat, we have incidental catch um, with birds being, um, especially frigate birds caught on monofilament line. We have um, rats, cats, dogs, and people are probably one of the biggest threats. Um, and we also have um, a, a de depletion of food resources due to overfishing and damage to reef both from the hurricanes and from historical dynamiting um, and other activities, changes in water quality. So that's another issue. Um, looking at the sort of the loss of colonies, um, we reckon that out of that seven over out of the 14 colonies, so seven colonies out of 14 have been lost mainly due to hurricane damage. Um, at least three of the remaining seven co colonies have invasive species, and at least three of them have permanent or temporary fishing camps. And the people there will be exploiting the, the um, birds, they exploit the turtles, um, and there's a risk that they will bring more invasive species. So CCAM is doing its best with very limited resources to um, conserve seabirds. Um, we monitor the keys annually. Um, no take zones or special fisheries conservation areas have been set up to protect the fisheries. Um, with de um, developing artificial reefs and coral nurseries, and there's a big education and um, awareness program going on, but it's hardly scratches the surface of the needs. So what next? Uh, we're looking to do a more comprehensive survey in 2023. Uh, we want to look at um, a more formal assessment of the distribution of the, the um, invasive species and follow that with some eradication. And we did some recent work on the herbs of the keys, which have established what we suspected that they're very important for native um, herbs, especially the Jamaica skink and the Jamaican ground lizard. Um, so there's, there's a strong argument for restore, for eradicating the invasive species, not just for the uh, birds, but also for the, um, um, for the herbs. We're looking at what we can do to restore the habitat. Um, we're currently, um, reviewing the management plan and we'll have try to get more formal legal zoning for protection of these keys so that they, people can't make crazy plans to put um, resorts out there and more education and awareness. Never, never enough of that. So thank you very much. Um, if there's any questions. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> We have a question by Tro Troy Franklin. Um, what are the primary invasive species and how are they affecting the native animals? Um, we, we've certainly, or some keys have rats. Um, some keys, they may have mice, we don't know. Um, and 
in the part, well, chickens, <laughs> so some there's chickens are a problem, we think. Um, and um, in the past, cats and dogs, but as far as we know, and we haven't actually had the resources to do a really in-depth assessment of the invasive species, but as far as we can tell, rat, um, dogs and cats aren't currently on any of the keys, but there's a continuing risk that they may be reintroduced. So. Okay, thank you. Maybe while um, you stop sharing your screen and Natalia starts her, I had a question for you, Anne, uh, asking, so if and when those islands disappear because of more hurricanes and sea level rise, do the seabirds have other options um, nearby or they have to move somewhere else? No, they, there's no, no other options. No other options. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. So now it's Natalia's turn. Um, can you hear me okay? We can hear slide nine of 18. Yeah, maybe go okay. back right there. <laughs> and we can see, actually, we are actually seeing your uh, presenter's mode. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let me try a different one. Hmm. Okay, how does that look? Yep, that looks good. That's the main slide. All right, okay. I'll let you know at about in about ten minutes. Okay, but so but hmm, I can't. Um, so if I do presenter view like this, you can still see everything. Yeah, uh, I mean we see the we see what, what we should see. We don't see the the notes. So we, oh, we okay. see what would gotcha. be on on the screen. Okay. Um, let's see. And then I will say hi, I'm Natalia Collier. Um, I'm here to speak today about the use of artificial intelligence in detecting non-native mammals at seabird colonies. This is a cooperative effort between um, the organization I'm with, Environmental Protection in the Caribbean or EPIC, as well as Ocean Spirits, which is based in Grenada, Conservation AI and Liverpool John Moores University, which are based in the UK. Um, as well as, um, well, let's see, Juliana Coffey is also an author on this who, who um, has a transboundary gren grenadines um, effort, um, but is also uh, an EPIC associate also. So um, other authors include Carl Chalmers, Paul Fergus, Kate Charles, and Serge Witch. So a little bit about the organization I'm with. Um, we are... Um, an organization that was established in 2000 in the U.S., protecting the Caribbean environment through research and community-based action. We also have a separate foundation registered in the island of St. Martin. And we've worked on throughout the Caribbean on many islands, and now we have a, um, a focus on the um, Grenadine Islands because we did a um, seabird breeding atlas of the Lesser Antilles in 2009, 2010, and identified this area as being uh, one of the most important in the region for seabirds, but also found that there are really significant um, conservation threats as well that weren't being addressed um, and a lot of gaps in knowledge. Um, so this is a the, the Grenadines is a transboundary area. It's part of the island, the islands of St. Vincent, as well as Grenada. Um, and it's an archipelago, it's a volcanic in origin. Um, there's about 100 islands of various sizes. Some are um, as large as like 32 square kilometers and some are less than a square kilometer, just little Ks, but only nine of them are inhabited. Um, and we have about 74 breeding sites for seabirds within this region. Um, most of them are privately, privately owned, um, but for many of them, the ownership isn't clear, which can be a challenge in conservation efforts, trying to figure out who you even get permission from to do something. Um, but um, we have done a lot of outreach in the region as well, trying to address some of the threats. Um, and this infographic was one of the things that we developed, you know, to have people be able to have posters they could put up in schools, dive shops, tourist facilities, um, that kind of thing. So we're trying to increase pride in local wildlife, especially the seabirds. Um, 
So as I mentioned, it's a very important region for seabirds. There's more than 30 species found there and of those 12 are breeding residents. Um, in the seven, about 74 sites, there's over 60,000 breeding pairs of seabirds and at least three sites of global importance and 18 of regional importance. Um, one thing that EPIC has also done is developed a community-based conservation plan. Um, this is a result of consultation with local stakeholders like government, NGOs, tourism, um, fisher folk, trying to identify uh, areas that uh, they feel were important, but also some of the threats that they've seen. And we now have a conservation plan committee that meets um, periodically to discuss priority actions and, and things that should be done to protect the seabirds and invasive species were definitely a key threat within this document and discussions um, that needs to be addressed. And so as part of that effort, we tried to map out where different um, non-native mammals are found on the uninhabited Grenadine Islands because clearly where there's people, there's more invasives. So we we're trying to just focus on the, the sites where seabirds are more likely to be um, nesting. And um, some of the accounts were confirmed, for example, through video or um, direct observation. Some of them were more anecdotal, anecdotal, like people just saying, oh, yeah, I've seen them out there, but we're not quite sure um, when that was or um, if that, you know, if that person um, is even referring to the same island. Sometimes there's confusion about the names of islands. And so um, that you can see in the map there, some of those are confirmed and some are anecdotal. And um, this was also the result of research done by EPIC, as well as citizen scientists that are part of the Grenadine Seabird Guardians. Um, this is a group that we help support um, through donations um, on our site called Global. We have a, a fundraising campaign on global giving where people can help contribute to help um, cover costs for folks that are going out to these remote islands with their boats. Um, and also the, the group Ocean Spirits, um, which is one of our partners on this effort, um, have done um, surveys for invasives as well. And they've used the camera traps, um, chew blocks, and tracking tunnels. Um, we found that rats are the most difficult thing to detect, you know, being nocturnal. Um, and often we're doing surveys during the day. And so you might be able to see some scat if you're lucky, but it's, it's really hard to find them. Um, so if you wanted to get more information on this work, it uh, was recently published in the Journal of Caribbean Ornithology. Um, and that would summarize this, this information. So um, what we found is that remote cameras were the easiest way to detect rats and other species as well, but because rats were the most difficult, that's what we were focused on. Um, we just got the most the most detections through that. Um, and of course, the issue with that is you end up with large volumes of footage you have to review. You could have lots of hours of, um, you know, maybe a tree's moving or something, and so you get um, movement that makes the camera activate and then you just have to kind of scroll through all this and try and see if there is actually something of interest in that um, and being a small organization that's a challenge for us to have that much staff time um, and some of the other things that we have tried I mentioned the chew blocks so that's like you put out um, little pieces of plastic that have food in them and you see if there's any chew, any chew marks on them but that can require some pretty specialized um, knowledge to be able to understand bite patterns and whether it was a crab or a mouse or a rat or whatever. Um, and the other thing we've used is tracking tunnels. So there's an ink pad that the rat walks over inside this tunnel and then they um, step onto some paper and that would leave a print as they go towards the bait that's that's beyond it. Um, but again, it's like trying to discern tracks and if they're smudged or whatever, it's it can be difficult to know exactly what you're looking at if you're not like a specialist, which which we are not. Um, as I mentioned, um, there can be false triggers like moving vegetation. And then, of course, it takes a lot of time to um, review the data. Um, and here we have a this is a photo from actually from Hispaniola of a cat at a colony, black cat petrol colony. But 
Um, so to address this issue of having lots of data to deal with, um, we started partnering with Conservation AI um, and using machine learning to try and sort through this, this these, these um, amounts of, of video we have. So um, in order to do this, we had to train the machine, or they did, I should say. Um, and so that required obtaining a lot of images for the machine to use to be able to identify what a rat looks like or a rodent of any sort. So we used 818 rodent images to train the model um, and the 1,639 goat images. And it's continuing to be populated. Um, it's something that um, can continue to be improved over time. But um, they also already had um, information on how to detect people and birds. Um, so we can also include those automatically with the system. So it's showing promising results. Um, it provides, as you can see in this image, it provides a percent confidence in identifying the subject. Um, so you can have about 90% accuracy with these rats, for example. And you can also check to see if there's false positives, and then you can confirm or deny them. Um, so for example, this top picture to me is really clear it's a goat. And the one on the bottom, I wasn't quite sure if it was a shadow or not, but then you could like zoom in and, and yeah, you could also confirm that, agree with the machine that it is that. Um, there's also the issue of partial views being detected. So in this top photo, it clearly knew that there was a booby, but then in the bottom photo, it didn't see that there was a tail, for example. So, um, there could be some that are missed because it's not getting the full image that it's been trained to detect where humans have a little more nuance to their detections. Um, this is something that's an open access database. Um, anyone can upload files to this AI and um, have their data be reviewed by it um, to detect non-native mammals, um, birds, people. Um, you just have to create an account at Conservation AI, and then on the dashboard, you choose which action you want to take. Um, they have a generic model that just detects people, animals, and cars. Um, our model is called Insular Caribbean, and as I mentioned, it detects people, goats, birds, and rodents. Um, you can also, if you go to observations, you can see recent observations and tags from uploaded content. Um, and then on the bottom left, um, you have a place specifically for camera trap footage. Um, and then you can also be a citizen scientist and help with tagging efforts by reviewing content in that tagging box. So um, a great way to get involved there. If you, even if you don't have your own um, content to upload, you can be part of science by doing that. You just reached 11 minutes, Natalia. Okay, well, that's that's the end. <laughs> um, so I want to thank everyone who um, made this work possible. Um, as many of you probably know, field work is difficult, and a lot of these islands are really remote, and so it took um, a lot of effort to be able to go out, place the cameras, retrieve them, review all the data. Um, and we received funding from the St. Vincent Grenadines Environment Fund, USAID, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, CARS Spa Rack. And we had partnerships with the government there, the Ministry of Agriculture for Grenada and St. Vincent and Grenadines. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Natalia. So there's a question from <clears throat> Raina Austin. So how transferable do you think the general models are to other islands or habitats? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I, I mean, I, I think What's nice about this region is it does have different habitats. As you saw in some of those pictures, there were um, trees and then a lot of the areas are more open. Um, so I think like, for example, there was a picture of the rat on the rock, you know, which that's a more open area. Um, so I think because rats and goats are sort of universal, um, I think it would transfer pretty well. Um, but it'd be, yeah, it'd be interesting to try it out and, and have people upload their their data and see, you know, 
success rate, you know, if we're getting similar confidence um, in the detections. So we have two more questions. <clears throat> One from Jen Segarra asking, which US Fish and Wildlife program you, uh, did you receive funding from? Uh, this is the Latin America program. In Latin America, Caribbean, yeah. And then a question from Damien White saying they used um, crema traps in Jamaica. Uh, can the AI use videos or just pictures? Yes, what we had was video. Um, so I suspect pictures would be, um, so the, the AI was reviewing video. Um, so I think if you had pictures, it would be even easier for it because it would have just the detection, like just the part that the camera took the photo of. Um, so yeah, we haven't actually tried that, but I think that it, it would work as well. And then Troy asked for a bit more details on how the conservation AI works. Do you just upload the pictures and it just looks for it? Or do you have to tell them, tell it what to look for? So you choose the um, the program you want it to run. So like I mentioned, ours is the one we developed was Insular Caribbean. Um, and that one looks for people, birds, goats, and rats, or rodents, I should say. It doesn't, it doesn't just differentiate between mice and rats. But um, yeah, so you would, um, I mean, of course, I would encourage you to contact them if you're having any, any issues. Um, they're very accessible and have been really responsive and helpful in all of this. Um, they, they really enjoy what they do and they want to help people be able to do it. But um, yeah, the idea is that you can just put upload your, your information through the portal and it will provide you with the detections. Okay, and then one last question from Damien. Um, could the AI and, and identify individual goats or just the species? No, it would just be the species. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for okay. your answer for your questions, mm -hmm. and thanks, Natalia, for your answers. And just going back before we we finish, we we tried to keep it for, for an hour, so we'll finish soon. But we had a question from Kirk Douglas um, about the um, avian influenza outbreak has been going through seabirds in in northern Europe and northern in North America and killing lots of seabirds there. Um, so the Kirk's question is, how concerned is Birds Caribbean about the current bird flu episodic impacting Europe and North America? Um, also, how accessible are seabird nesting sites in the Caribbean for assembling for bird flu um, and testing? Um, so we within the working group have not discussed it yet um, because the, the seabird season has not started, but I think it's something that we should yeah, start to Really think about there is a lot of resources coming in from uh, Europe, as you mentioned, and, and North America also on other seabird species, um, mostly gannets and, and, and terns. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a very good, good point that you're raising. Um, although those Caribbean species may not interact with those um, temperate species, um, it's very likely that bird flu will spread to the Caribbean or might spread to the Caribbean and other regions. I'm not sure about Birds Caribbean itself at the institutional level. Uh, Jennifer, do you have an answer to that? If you're still around, Jennifer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Just while, while, she, while she replies, I, I would say that I don't, as far as I know, we haven't really considered it. Um, at, a, at any any level at all, and it's definitely something we should start thinking about. Um, yeah, so thank you for raising that issue. Yes, I sorry, it's Jennifer, and I would echo Anne. I don't think we've really gotten our heads around it as an organization yet. No, like Epic in the past has done um, bird flu testing um, kind of throughout the region, but that was an initiative um, from an outside entity that that had set aside funding for that. And I think as with many things in the Caribbean, funding is the limiting factor. Um, but I, I also, I think that because of this effort to do the seabird census um, in 2023, we've got a great network of people that are in a position to potentially you know, do sampling if, if that was available. Yeah, that's the second part of the question. Are nesting sites available, uh, accessible, sorry, and well, as you, as you say, some of them are. 
uh, some of them are more remote islands and there it's more the funding that's limiting uh, much more on the accessibility of sites. Um, and, and when we did the testing but previously, it was mostly water birds because they are more accessible when you're on you know, the, the inhabited islands and just sort of the wetlands rather than having to reach these remote seabird nesting sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's probably something we should think about in terms of the, um, the, the, the uh, when, as we plan for 2023, um, what kind of testing um, can we, add to our protocols feasibly or can we are there people who would come and do the testing um and of course in, in there's also a, the question of the risk to people who are in contact with birds as well mm -hmm. but um yeah i think something we should definitely follow up on yeah <clears throat> and while we're, while we're talking about 2023 in case anybody hasn't um being exposed to the thing yet, or we are planning to do comprehensive um, seabird colony counts as as many possible places as we can across throughout the region in 2023. And yeah, so watch this space for more information on that. Maybe if Ivan wants to add something. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, so as many of you know, we are having these webinars to prepare for that. Um, we're planning to have more webinars in November. Um, sorry about the 2023 effort uh, on different methodologies like uh, acoustics and drones, and then another seabird hour like this one about presenting um, more presentation about seabird work, and um, hopefully in December or early January. For the people who are still around, um, I forgot to mention that Birds Caribbean had a few um, grants available. Uh, I'm sharing the link in the in the chat box. Uh, they, they just shared the, the call for grants for bird conservation, but seabirds can be included in all of them. So feel free to look at that and, and apply. And if you want to reach out to us for help in, in writing grant proposal or reviewing grant proposals before you send them, uh, feel free to do so as well. Uh, Ivan, Damien White. Has his hand raised? Oh, okay, I think it was left over from before, but. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I can allow you to talk, Damien, if you have it. Oh, it just left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Damien, for you for your questions. By the way, so thank you everyone for being here. It was great to um, to see these presentations again, and uh, we'll let you know when we have more webinars coming up. Okay, I'll, I'll allow Damien to talk since he raised his, uh, his hand again. Go ahead, Damien. Good day. Um, just a quick question to, um, to the panel. So I've been documenting a number of activities occurring with seabirds and sewage plants in Jamaica. And I am trying to find um, documents that are um, looking at the possible impacts because we find that they're breeding, but they're also feeding. Um, I have documenting their feeding on the surface and feeding and stuff. So I was just asking, um, I know generally we don't look at that. I mean, last year we had this very weird phenomenon where we had um, over a hundred or more um, lease turns nesting on one of the plants that we were doing some construction. So we were documenting acoustic videos, the predators that go there and all of that. But they have been feeding. So we have like royal turns, um, sandwich turns and you name it, foraging on in these environments. And the question I was just going to put to the panel, just to ask if anybody has seen any impacts or is it okay? Thanks, yeah, it's a good question. I know that in Europe, they've been um, doing some work on that on gulls uh, that do feed at um, water treatment plants. plants. Um, I'm not sure they observe an impact in terms of diseases or um, uh, health. Um, but um, I, I know there are some articles that have been published uh, on that. Uh, so if you have access to something like Google, Google Scholar and, you, and you, you can find, you should be able to find the articles there if they're behind a paywall 
and you've been asked to pay, feel free to send us an email to me. Uh, I can put my, my email in the chat box or to the working group on, on, the, on the listserv. If you are on our listserv, Damien, uh, and then we can find articles for you and send them back to you, for, uh, the PDF, if that helps. All right, thank you. I was just sharing it with the, the panel. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, so I guess we'll end here. Um, this recording, we were recording, so this recording will be, we'll put it on YouTube. We will try to uh, add subtitles in Spanish and French to it. Uh, we just need some time to translate them. Um, so thank you very much, and we'll be in touch through the listserv. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.